Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In Jacksonville, Florida, a gunman shot and killed three black people Saturday in a racist attack which the U.S. Justice Department's investigating as a hate crime. The three victims, who were killed in front of and inside a dollar store, were identified as 52-year-old Angela Michelle Carr, 19-year-old Anult Joseph, known as A.J. Laguerre, Jr., and 29-year-old Gerald Deshaun Gallion. The shooter was identified as Ryan Palmiter, a 21-year-old white man who died by suicide after his rampage. This is Jacksonville Sheriff T.K. Waters. The shooter had authored several manifestos, one to his parents, one to the media, and one to federal agents. Portions of these manifestos detailed the shooter's disgusting ideology of hate. Plainly put, this shooting was racially motivated, and he hated black people. The gunman had no criminal history and legally purchased the two weapons he used earlier this year, a Glock handgun and an AR-15-style rifle. The guns had swastikas drawn on them. Before the attack, the shooter was seen at Edward Waters University, a historically black college. He drove away after a security guard turned him back. On Sunday, Governor Ron DeSantis spoke at a vigil where he was booed by crowds. One attendee shouted, "'Your policies cause this.'" Florida Governor DeSantis and Florida Republicans have imposed racist laws, including rolling back diversity and inclusion policies and attacking African American studies. DeSantis also opposes gun law reform. As the massacre in Jacksonville was unfolding in Washington, D.C., thousands of people gathered for the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington, where Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech. Gregory Jackson of the Community Justice Action Fund addressed gun violence in his speech. Every year, over 138,000 people are killed from this crisis. This is the number one cause of death for all youth in America, the number one cause of death for all black men in America, the number two cause of death for all black women and all Latino men in America. But yet we have not seen the action to deal with the biggest health crisis of our time. In the past 30 years, we have only seen one law passed to address gun violence. One law. And yet our bodies are laying on the pavement every day. Every eight minutes, another life is lost. In Zimbabwe, President Emerson Mnangagwa was declared the winner of last week's election, securing another five-year term after a delay in polls and accusations of a rigged election. European election observers said the vote fell short of established standards, noting, quote, acts of violence and intimidation resulted ultimately in a climate of fear, unquote. Zimbabwean opposition leader Nelson Chamisa called the election a gigantic fraud and asked neighboring countries to intervene. It is clear that we are rejecting the election is a sham, the result. The process itself, we disregard it, and it's in line with what the Sadiq observers have said. We reject this sham result and flawed process based on the disputed figures. The Western African nation of Gabon shut down Internet access and imposed a curfew following its national election Saturday amidst voting delays and as opposition leader Albert Ando Osa denounced fraud in his challenge against incumbent President Ali Bongo Ondimba. Bongo has already served two seven-year terms. His family's been in power for over half a century. Critics accuse Bongo of not using Gabon's oil wealth to improve the lives of one-third the population living in poverty. In Niger, military coup leaders ordered armed forces on maximum alert as they warned of a heightened threat of attacks by ECOWAS troops. The West African bloc has readied their forces to intervene if a diplomatic resolution to the coup is not reached. Meanwhile, Niger's junta ordered the French ambassador to leave the country. Demonstrators rallied Friday to show support for the military rulers one month after the July 26 coup. We're not in the 18th century, where someone has to impose or dictate to us what we should do. No, this is about our independence, and I believe that if the CNSP takes a decision, it must be respected. France must realize that this is no longer the colonial era. Today, we're in the 21st century, and France must learn to respect our ideals if it wants things to move forward together.
In Haiti, at least seven people were killed after gang members armed with machine guns opened fire on protesters in Canaan Sunday. The rally against gang violence had been organized by a local church. Canaan is a makeshift town near the capital, Port-au-Prince, built by people who lost their homes in Haiti's devastating 2010 earthquake. Survivors of Sunday's attack also placed blame on the pastor who organized the rally, then continued the march even as the shooting broke out. They opened fire on us with all sorts of guns. The pastor's followers really believed what he told them. He said they were bulletproof, that those who were wounded had no faith. I was there. I saw everything with my own eyes. They were firing and the pastor was walking. Hundreds of thousands of Haitians have been internally displaced or forced to migrate due to worsening violence. The U.N. reported some 8,700 residents have been forced to take shelter in a crowded sports center in Port-au-Prince. Russian authorities say genetic analysis has confirmed Wagner Group chief Yevgeny Prigozhin died in last Wednesday's plane crash, along with some of Wagner's top officials. The Kremlin has denied responsibility for the crash, which happened just two months after Prigozhin led a, an aborted mutiny against Russia's military, and President Vladimir Putin vowed to punish the act. In Guatemala, a former military colonel has been convicted of crimes against humanity for his involvement in the killing of over two dozen indigenous people in 1982. Juan Ovalle Salazar was sentenced to 20 years in prison. The massacre of 25 Maya Achi people, most of them children, took place during some of the bloodiest years of Guatemala's U.S. funded war and came under the ruling of U.S. backed military dictator Fran Rios Montt. Eight former members of the Guatemalan Armed Forces were acquitted. Rights activists continue to demand justice. We want those responsible for the massacre of our brothers in Rancho Bajuco and Baja Verapaz to be sentenced by the judges. As we have always said, as long as there is no justice in Guatemala, peace cannot be built. Rios Montt was convicted of genocide in a historic 2013 trial. That ruling was later overturned by a hard higher court. In related news, a judge in Guatemala City has granted former President Otto Pérez Molina's request to be released from prison and be placed on house arrest. The former president first has to pay several fines, totaling about $1.3 million. He was forced to resign following historic nationwide protests in 2015, convicted of corruption and running a multimillion-dollar bribe scheme. He was sentenced to 16 years in prison in 2022. Pérez Molina served as a regional commander under Rios Montt, using a different name. Back in the U.S., a Texas ban on gender-affirming care for youth is set to go into effect this week on Friday, despite an injunction issued last week against the ban. The Travis County judge said in her Friday ruling the law would cause patients and providers to, quote, suffer probable, imminent and irreparable injury, unquote. But Texas's attorney general immediately appealed, staying the decision. Meanwhile, a Missouri judge allowed a ban on gender-affirming care for minors and some adults to take effect starting today. The law is currently being challenged by rights groups on behalf of doctors, groups serving the trans community and affected families. In Georgia, a federal judge in Atlanta is hearing arguments today from the legal team of Donald Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, as he attempts to move his charges to federal court, where Meadows could claim immunity due to his position in government at the time of the offenses. The outcome could have major implications for Trump and other co-defendants in Fulton County's racketeering indictment over Trump and his allies' attempts to overturn his 2020 election loss. All 19 defendants have now surrendered. Fulton County DA Fannie Willis has expressed expected to set up her case against the co-conspirators during today's arguments. Separately, a trial date is expected to be announced today in Trump's federal election interference case. Trump's lawyers are attempting to postpone his trial until 2026, while federal prosecutors have proposed a January start date. The European Union's sweeping new rules on large tech companies kicked in Friday as lawmakers seek to rein in harmful and illegal content and digital monopolies. The new legislation regulates social media, targeted advertising, user 
privacy policies and fake or illicit products from e-commerce sites. Among the affected companies are Amazon, Apple, Google, Meta, Microsoft, Snapchat and TikTok. Violations could lead to billions of dollars in fines. And here in the United States, Donald Trump made his return to X, formerly known as Twitter, Thursday with a fundraising post featuring his mugshot. Trump had been banned from Twitter following the January 6th insurrection, but that ban was lifted after Elon Musk purchased Twitter. Earlier this month, the rights groups and users of X sounded the alarm after reports that paying subscribers to the platform will have to send their ID and a selfie for verification to an Israeli software company. The firm, Attentix, was founded by former Israeli intelligence officers and has been implicated in Israel's surveillance of Palestinians. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report.